Hi, Sarah Childress back with you. You know, I was just reading about Beijing and New Delhi, two of the world's air pollution capitals. Now, in 2013, the Chinese government clamped down on factories and old vehicles, emissions from old vehicles, and shifted also from coal to natural gas. And as a result, they today enjoy more than 100 more days of clear skies. In contrast, New Delhi, uh, in New Delhi, the government really does lack the political resolve and the public pressure required to clean up the pollution from the factories, from the millions of vehicles, and also from the field burning and the open fires that make the air pollution in New Delhi really kind of catastrophic. And so the reason I'm bringing this up is that pollution, as well as an increase in religiously motivated violence, they form a kind of an apocalyptic backdrop to a tender and beautiful observational documentary that I saw a couple of weeks ago, which is All That Breathes. Now, this context, the air pollution, the religiously motivated violence, they provide the stakes for Salik Saad and Nadim's work. Those are the three main characters. Now, these three men are Muslims and they care for wounded kites and other non-vegetarian birds like owls and vultures, birds that the primarily Hindu population really don't want anything to do with. Now, some of these, these birds have chronic bone diseases, others have wounds that are like naturally inflicted or inflicted by, by humans. Um, some are malnourished and some simply have just fallen from the sky because of the air pollution. Um, but all of them are gathered up by these three men and brought into their clinic. And the, the, the touching thing is, or the horrifying thing is, there are so many, I mean, in one, in one moment, in one day, Salik brings in 28 birds, each in his own cardboard box. And most of the time they have 100 or more birds that they're tending to um, within their clinic. Now, the birds, as you might imagine, are important characters. And the film really treats them as lovingly and respectfully as the men do. And one of the ways that the film does this is through these really beautiful, long tracking shots that reveal each of the birds kind of self-containment. I mean, these, these birds really are universes unto themselves. And each is as important as a universe and an integral part of it. And, and we see this really in a montage sequence that at first reminded me kind of of a fashion shoot or an art exhibition with these beautiful portraits on the walls because there's a, a series of birds that are stunningly lit and kind of closely and painstakingly photographed. But I don't think the film is as much turning them into aesthetic objects here as much as it is working to reveal the perfection of their forms. I mean, not just the perfection of their forms, but their perfection. But though it does this, and it does keep the, the birds as, as very important characters, it's really the central characters of the film are the three men. And the film gives us ample time to observe their personalities, their division of labor, and the close relationships that have formed between them. Now, Nadim, who seems to be the elder of the trio, he's kind of what we might call the back office man. I mean, he creates and administers the website. He handles marketing and PR. Uh, he also manages, the, very importantly, the funding efforts because he's kind of ceaselessly pursuing these ever harder to find international and domestic sources of funding. But, I mean, even though he does dedicate his life and all of his, pretty much all of his time to this cause, and he is a true supporter, but we see very clearly that he yearns for more. Now, Saad, who is, uh, just to be like the, the middle of, of the three, he is the one who primarily provides medical care for the birds. And as we, we learn, and this comes quite early, so it's not a spoiler, he's basically self-taught. I mean, the, these three have all kind of taught themselves how to provide this kind of care. And he provides, as I was saying, the medical care primarily for the birds, but he's assisted by the younger Salik. And for Saad and Salik, the birds are everything. I mean, for them, nature is everything, and they tirelessly and tenderly care for all. I mean, in fact, they even at some points kind of risk their lives to save one bird. 
and being privy to their work and their philosophies is truly an honor and a privilege as a viewer. Because the film also does a beautiful job bringing uh, one of their central philosophies really into, into focus. And, and the central philosophy was passed down from Saad and Nadim's mother to them. And what this philosophy is, is that one should not distinguish between all that breathes. That we should not privilege one life over another since all are interrelated. And the film does such a wonderful job literalizing that, like expressing that idea through its series of long tracking shots, which I've mentioned. Um, and, and, and that was one example when I was talking about kind of the beauty shot, but there are also other long tracking shots. I mean, it is a motif of, the, of a film. And often these long tracking shots are at a camera position that is at the same height as the animals. So human camera height is not privileged in this film. It's actually animal camera height that becomes the dominant form or the dominant shape of these, shape of these long tracking shots. And this is certainly a significant critical and cre creative decision and one that I think really imbues this film not only with the, the thematic resonance that it wants, but also is a, is a wonderful experience for us as humans to kind of put ourselves into the place, into the perspective, into the position of these, of these animals. But I have to admit, as much as I love these long tracking shots, the thing that I think is really <laughs> such an incredible cinematographic coup and a motif that I could really not get enough of is the film's use of rack focus. And it uses rack focus to draw our attention to various life forms that are all proximate within space. And so using rack focus rather than deep focus in my opinion, equalizes the planes and the life forms. And if I am able to in the future to get a clip that demonstrates this, I, I promise you I will show it to you because I think it's just, it's, it's so beautiful. But until I can actually literally visually show you, uh, I should be careful about using the word literal or literally, but before I, until I can visually show you, let me just um, describe one of my favorite shots. And in this shot, it, it, there, it begins with an image that really focuses on a festive event. I think it's a group of people cele celebrating around a bonfire, but then it racks to what we now see is the foreground of that shot. And that shot is actually the camera height is basically at snail level. So in the background, we have the human festivities going on. And in the foreground, we have this kind of magnificent snail, as large as the people were, kind of calmly, snail likely <laughs> making its way across the frame. I mean, it really is just a glorious, glorious shot. And so I hope that you will be able to, um, to see this absolutely gorgeous and mesmerizing, mesmerizing film. It was here in theaters for, um, for a little bit, a few days. It's been gone for a while now. But since it is an HBO documentary, I'm hoping that we will be able to access it on HBO Max sometime in the very near future. And if it's available, I hope you will check it out. Thanks so much. See you next time.